you could design your baby's features, would you? According to LA's Fertility Institute, prospective parents can select eye color, hair color, and more. The technology is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD. It was created to screen for disease, then used for gender selection. Now this clinic plans to allow parents to select physical traits. I would predict that by next year we will have determined sex with 100% certainty on a baby, and we will have determined eye color with about an 80% accuracy rate. Dr. Jeffrey Steinberg is a pioneer in in vitro fertilization. I think it's very important that we not bury our heads in the sand and pretend that these advances aren't happening. Kirsten and Matt Landon used his clinic to select the sex of their daughter. Choosing other genetic traits intrigues them. I would have considered trait selection um, as an option, but not necessarily have gone with it. Oh, yes. A recent U.S. survey suggests most people support the notion of building a better baby when it comes to eliminating serious diseases. But Dr. Steinberg says using technology for cosmetic reasons shouldn't scare people away. Of course, once I've got this science, am I not to provide this to my patients? I'm a physician. I want to provide everything science gives me to my patients. You've come a long way, baby. Hattie Kaufman, CBS News, Los Angeles. Throughout the course of history, there have been periods when mankind made rapid advances. And then there are those other, much more numerous times that remain rather unnoticed as transitory periods. Now, at the dawn of the third millennium, how will this age be judged by posterity? And more importantly, what form will that posterity take? And what kind of judgment will it be capable of? The world is on the verge of global change. The speed of data transmission has increased by multiples of millions. The rate of globally significant events and that of discoveries and crises is growing exponentially. Our civilization is like an uncaptained ship sailing on rough seas with neither chart nor compass, all the while moving faster and faster. The time we have to make the right decisions is shorter and shorter. We are facing the choice to fall into a new dark age, into affliction and degradation, or to find a new model for human development and create not simply a new civilization, but a new mankind. We are going to become gods. Period. If you don't like it, get off. You don't have to contribute. You don't have to participate. But if you're going to interfere with me, becoming God. We are shifting to a trans-human base. We've come out of a humanist time, and now we're redefining what it is to be human. Whether we like it or not, we're becoming cyborgs. We're becoming transhumans. We have the opportunity now to try to do things uh, better uh, than uh, nature has done. Why not have a stronger arm than we have? Uh, you know, why not be able to run faster? Why not be able to have uh, tougher skins? you're going to replace your eye for vision, uh, why limit it uh, to visual? Why not give it the kind of vision a bat has, give it ultrasound? Could you imagine a Versace body design? Can you imagine a Terry Muller body design? These individuals, the late Versace was an incredible designer. What if he was a transhuman? What if he was an artist who really wanted to combine art and science? I bet his designs for a future body would be astounding. We really, really do want to violate human limits now, and we're getting closer and closer to the ability to do it. It's what we want. And here we are in the brain research laboratory. Yeah, here's, here's the brain when it was stored. Dr. Robert White is a neurosurgeon at the Cleveland Medical Hospital in Ohio. Now, here are some pictures. In 1963, he performed the first experiment to keep a brain alive outside the body. This is a human skull here. That's and not real. This is a gorilla. See here, when you take the brain out and isolate it, you can take all that if you want. 
and you keep it alive and live forever. See, it's, it's uh... uh This is a human brain, actually, and it is fixed. So no one needs to worry about it being alive. There have been many attempts throughout the world, particularly in the, uh, the old Soviet Union, to take the brain out of an animal. They like the dog, for example and keep it alive with machinery. Now you can do that with the heart, the kidney, the liver, the lung, all the other body organs, solid organs. But nobody had ever been able to do it with the brain. And part of the reason is we must remember the brain is very delicate when it comes to its blood supply. And so when we finally did it and found that this brain uh, of a highly developed animal uh, had brain waves, that biochemistry was functioning just as it would. Now, we couldn't talk to it. We could send it electrical signals. We could show that it could actually hear and so forth, but we didn't know whether it was processing the information. But the point of it all is that that moment in time also said to us, if you can do it for the animal brain, you could do it for the human brain. This, this incredibly brilliant scientist, Stephen Hawking, who's a astrophysicist, actually. He is now per in a wheelchair and literally speaks via a computer. And some people, perhaps unkindly, have described this wonderful man as sort of a head on a computer, basically. But uh, he would be somebody who potentially could survive his diseased body through a total body transplant prove that the brain was in fact functioning normally while in this state, Dr. White needed to undertake a second experiment, during which he succeeded in transplanting the head of a monkey onto the body of another. The creature survived for seven days before the body rejected the head. In the monkey experiments, these animals are as much a monkey as they were when they were in their own original body. So I would presume, and I'd go beyond that, I would be assured that the monkey personality is retained. So consciousness can be transplanted. Uh, obviously, personality, if you want to speak of the monkey having personality, can be transferred. And so you might ask, where did this bring us as far as the human spirit or soul goes? And I guess you could argue it can be transplanted. We are now becoming the objects of conscious design. And the implications of that are just enormous because we've gone, until now, we've been reshaping the world around us. And we can see how dramatically it's been changing. I mean, we've really res reshaped the landscape and we've built a society and altered society and changed everything that's external to us. But somehow we imagined that we were going to remain the same, that, there would, that we ourselves were not going to be caught up in this process. And that's not, in fact, true. We are going to remake ourselves. And it's very difficult to deal with because it will rip free all of the anchors that have until now told us who we are as human beings. We're at the end of a definition of what a normal human being is. Every living thing is defined by its DNA code. The DNA is a long string consisting of four different molecules called A, T, C, and G, found in all living cells. So it is, in essence, a digital barcode that defines us as humans, just as it defines every other life form on this planet. Only the variety of combinations of these four elements makes us differ from one another. The Human Genome Project was started in 1990 as the largest technological enterprise ever, with a budget far outstripping that of the race to the moon and involving hundreds of laboratories around the world, all with one main goal. Fundamentally, it was about determining the complete sequence of the human genome, the three billion letters that make up our genetic blueprint and we know we have the code before us and it's truly remarkable it is a digital code and buried within that code 
is information about what are all the genes necessary for making a human brain and all the genes necessary uh, for making a human liver or the heart or, or any part of the human body. And uh, now the fun stuff begins because we get to start to crack that code having the order of the letters in front of us. But fundamentally, it is very much a digital code. The secret of life itself, the DNA molecule, a genetic discovery that could give man the ability to create life to specifications. Never have we had such opportunity or such awesome responsibility. Change DNA structure in the lab is fairly straightforward and it's fairly simple. You can study a piece of DNA to unravel its function. You modify the composition and you see what the effect is on function. That's daily routine in a lab that has this technology. Going from the lab to the person to therapy, in theory, is the same thing and is as simple. In practice, it has been shown that it's a lot more difficult. And the reason why it's so difficult is not that we don't know what pieces of DNA to put in, is that we do not succeed sufficiently uh, and at a high rate in getting these pieces of DNA in the right cells. But we have learned how to do it from nature. What is a viral infection? It's a virus that sticks to the cells, that enters the cells, and that uses the machinery of the cells to multiply itself. Now you take this virus, you cut out the pieces that are dangerous, so that it will still stick and be engulfed, but not develop in the cell. And then you add to this some other tools that the virus then can use to cut out the bad DNA, stick in, splice in the good DNA. This is a mechanism that is used now to do gene therapy using viruses. The ability to tamper with our genes has obvious applications. We can change DNA to prevent or cure hereditary diseases. We can alter the DNA of donor organs that are to be used for transplants so that the body of the recipient won't reject them. The organ doesn't even need to come from a human being. It could perfectly well be that of an animal. Pigs would be a good supply of kidneys or other organs to transplant in humans. But because of the difference between the, the two, the two species, the pig kidney or the pig liver will be rejected by the human. So if we can humanize the pig kidney by putting in some human DNA, which will make the cells look a little, a little bit more human so that they are not rejected uh, by the person immediately, then there's a better chance that you'll have a take. And this is tried to humanize uh, animal tissues and it's becoming a big industry because we need more organs. This body is not sacred. The way we are is not some kind of God-given plan. It's really a pure random accident. We take two sets of genes 
and we shuffle them and something comes out. Sometimes it's a wonderful product, sometimes it has a hole in the heart, sometimes it has psychosis or uh, tendencies towards you know, extreme anger, uh, has addictive problems, can't concentrate, all kinds of t defects. To say, oh, that's normal, that's sacred, that's good, to me is rather absurd. It's just, it's random. There's not a plan there that we're thwarting. So genetic engineering seems to me one of the most moral things we can do. A single species is defined by the isolation of our genetics, reproductive isolation. But when you begin to take genes from different species to mix together all of the genetics that is available among all animals and also to design new alterations to the genetics, well, reproductive isolation really doesn't have much meaning anymore. And so you can imagine all sorts of forms and that will evolve in the future. In the future, we will be able to sculpt our bodies like living sculpture. Our bodies could be beautiful electronic designs that shimmer prismatically in the light, in the morning light. It could change forms. It could become a piece of marble on one hand and then totally mutate into some fluid type of luminescent snake-like quality. After all, the body is an extension of fashion. You can rearrange the human body and try to make humans fly even though humans are very heavy. And some mammals fly like bats fly, but they're much lighter. But it's an intriguing question because it brings up the issue of not just trying to take an injured human and returning them to normal, but taking a human and making them superhuman, making them go beyond. Our future is not to try and hold back genetic engineering, but to try and use it in a way that best serves us. If we can, if our children can be more intelligent and healthier and live longer lives through altering our genetics, why would we not want to do it? I mean, imagine if other children could live for two centuries and if you could only live for 80 years because your parents believed that it was improper to tamper with human genetics. You would not be pleased with that decision. The same thing if your IQ were a normal IQ and all of your classmates were much, much brighter because there had been sort of some biological or genetic manipulation that was possible you'd feel very angry about this. Plans to allow scientists to create embryos that are part human and part animal are set for approval by the official regulator in Britain. These hybrid embryos are seen by the country's leading scientists as a vital step in the search for cures for diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It's a highly controversial procedure and is banned in some European countries. Our medical correspondent Fergus Walsh has the story. This embryo is part mouse, part cow. In a few months, this Newcastle lab is hoping to create a human-cow hybrid. If that leaves you uneasy, the scientists here understand how you feel. It does seem a little abhorrent from a first analysis that the fact that we're mixing cow uh, bits of cow cells with, with bits of human cells. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a science fiction movie. It's 2013. Many of the technologies developed by DARPA and the globalists using Western ingenuity have developed technologies they say themselves 30 to 50 years advanced than what the public knows in the national security complex. 26 years ago humanoids were being grown in the uteruses of cows. The guys just searched the uh, glow-in-the-dark part jellyfish monkeys. We'll put those on screen for viewers. There they are. That's the uh, Sunday uh, Mercury newspaper. And there is the glow-in-the-dark monkey. 
Last time I checked, they're coming out with monkeys with gills that can live in a fish tank. There's glow-in-the-dark rats and uh, glow-in-the-dark rabbits. And the issue here is, ladies and gentlemen, this is old technology. This was in the late 1990s being sold like something on a Blade Runner on the streets in Asia.